it's really hard as a person of color to learn to appreciate themselves. Our society excluded us from textbooks in schools. Um, we were hardly ever shown to be anything other than, you know, perhaps criminal. And uh, by producing the book, I feel I have um, freed myself from a lot of those fears. I think fear has been the number one operative in much of my life and uh, I'm not afraid anymore. Hi, I'm Tamara and this is Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart. Today I'm speaking with Valerie Jerome. Valerie is a retired track and field sprinter, educator and political activist. Today we discuss her experience growing up as a black child in North Vancouver, her journey to becoming an Olympian and her new book, it's called Races, The Trials and Triumphs of Canada's Fastest Family. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Valerie. It's great to see you. Hi. How are you doing? Are you having a good day so far in all the snow? A good day so far, far is right. I can't tell you how honored I am to have you uh, on this podcast and to speak to you. It's, um, you know, it's it's a real honor to have you. Um, Thank you. I I feel I'm the one honored here, so I'm great to meet you. Oh, wow. Well. That's nice of you to say. You have a new book out. It's called Races, The Trials and Triumphs of Canada's Fastest Family. And for people who might not be aware, um, your brother is, uh, you and your brother are very well known. And of course, your grandfather too, um, as athletes in Canada. But for, for somebody who might not be familiar with your family, how would you describe your family? Um, I would say that our my brother and I were blessed with the genes of our grandfather, whom we never met and knew absolutely nothing about for most of our lives, well, for all of Harry's life. And uh, uh, yeah, my grandfather was somebody to be proud of. And in, in writing this book, I, I got to find out and to learn and appreciate um, his gift to us because I feel that uh, genetically we certainly had something going for us. Yeah. yeah, you definitely did. So your your grandfather, John Army Howard, I guess his nickname was Army, was it? Yes, yes, yes. His middle name was Armstrong. He went by the name Army, yes. Oh, my goodness. So he was Canada's first black Olympian. That's right. And uh, as a matter of fact, there were very few blacks in the Olympics, period. It was a... An, I, I don't know whether you saw the film Chariots of Fire, um, fabulous film, Harry's all-time favorite. Um, it was a sport. The Olympics were an event for the well-to-do, and uh, they really did try to keep it for the uh, for the people who didn't do physical labor in their jobs. And uh, um, so, yeah, the Olympics, uh, including my, you know, to have included my grandfather, uh, was was quite something. The Canadian coach of the team just despised my grandfather, and um, and I mention in the book the ridicule he tolerated or barely tolerated when he went to the nineteen twelve Olympics. Um, they tried very hard to have him excluded for reasons of allegedly being, you know, the whole business of being amateur uh, has been very important up until 1985 uh, when athletes began receiving monies for their, for their performance. And of course, now it's totally professional. I think uh, Degrassi has got a contract for something like $11 million, you know. Well, we didn't dare accept 10 cents for fear of losing our amateur status. And that was very much adhered to in 1912. Um, they, my grandfather didn't find out until hours before his race that uh, his first heat that he was eligible to run because they were trying to block him for having, you know, received monies or whatever. So, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I've come up with a very, very strange theory just recently because of one of the questions asked in one of my presentations. Um, they, they tried so hard to block my grandfather. He had beaten the two Americans, the men who come first and second in the final of the Olympics, 100 and 200 meters. My grandfather had defeated them in both Toronto and Winnipeg weeks before the games. 
And uh, because he wasn't allowed to eat in the dining room with the rest of the athletes, he was preparing his own food in the uh, in the, in his room. And I I feel that he statistics tell us that he won his heat handily, um, which I would assume he did very well. And yet um, in his semifinal, he's so physically ill, his stomach is so upset, he's unable to run. So, or he runs and, and places last. And so I've almost, uh, this was a question from a, a young kid at this um, tech school I was doing a presentation at. Uh, do you think he was sabotaged? Do you think his food was tampered with? And I must say, over the last few weeks, I've thought that question over. But of course, there's no proving any of that. And I mean, the, well, the Olympics, you know, so your grandfather in, in Stockholm in, in 1912, and then you and your brother were both at the 1960 Rome Olympics. That's right. So we didn't know anything about our grandfathers, except we knew that he'd been a runner. And um, so in 1959, when we went to the Canadian Championships, I mean, we were the only black athletes at the meet. I mean, Canada was very, very white. You know, our immigration laws were such that Canada only took in 100 black people, 50 people from India a year. And all through the teens and the 20s, Canada was advertising for immigrants, for white people to come from Europe and make sure this is a white country and the indigenous people were, of course, locked away on the reservations. And the Chinese were discouraged with head tax and exclusion laws. And people from India and, and black people were, were limited to 50. So everything about our lives was totally white. I lived in North Vancouver. I never, ever saw anyone from the um, Indian reservation down the hill uh, until I was in grade 12. That was the first time I even was aware of physically seeing an Indigenous person in my community. So in 1959, we went to the Canadian Championships. And unlike the track meets of today, where everybody on the start line is black in the men's final of the 100 meters, and I won't say everybody, but you know what I mean. Uh, we went to that meet, and uh, and there was one other black athlete, uh, Paul Wynn was there. But anyway, when when we did so well, I won the hundred and the and the sixty and the long jump and came third in the high jump, and Harry won the hundred. I mean, you know, we were sort of like a freak show. Not only were we winning handily, but we were black and um, aliens. So the following year, the nineteen sixty Olympic trials. Um, um, you know, there we were, these two black Canadians. And I think in the interim between my grandfather's um, uh, time of competition, I know in 1938, a black man from Canada named Phil Edwards won the 800 meters in the uh, Commonwealth Games. And uh, other than that, I don't know that between our grandfather being the first and when we competed, uh, you know, it wasn't as though there were then black people on Canada's Olympic teams. But, uh, yeah, it... Uh, what do you remember from that time? Like, what do you remember from the Rome Olympics? Can you... Because how old were you? I, I just turned 16. It was two months after my 16th birthday. And uh, what do I remember? Well, I remember Rome was extraordinarily hot. It was... Um, they had had a heat wave that had been nine weeks without rain and whatever. But what I remember was this mass of athletes and, and the Canadians were such a small team. We took 12 women to those Olympics, four swimmers, four track people and diver and a gymnast. Um, so our Canadian team was small. So we had a choice of eating in either the dining room of the Brits or with the Americans. Well, for me, I'd never seen so many gorgeous black American men. So we actually ate with, you know, Muhammad Ali, as he was called Cassius Clay there uh, at that time. And um, it, it was, you know, for, you know, a pubescent 16-year-old uh, girl, it was, a, it, was a, it was a pretty hot time. I was, I actually went few times with the world record holder in the high jump, this young, handsome uh, John Thomas. So, you know, those kinds of things were just about as important to me as were the, uh, the competitions, where I knew I was really, really out of my league, enormously out of my league. You know, I qualified with Olympic standard, but, uh, you know, it, 
from North Vancouver to training on this dreadful pile of rocks behind Sutherland Junior High School, uh, you know, in the dark, no, no, not even track lanes or even a curb for this somewhat of an oval, you know. I mean, we did train most of the time at Brockton Oval and Stanley Park, but to get through that winter prior to those Olympic Games, it uh, it was in the dark, you know, with uh, without my coach, but with a very good friend who would make sure I'd do the workouts because Harry had gone away to Oregon on a scholarship. So, yeah, those Olympics were a big um, event. I was just saying to somebody, probably I've said it more than to one somebody, but uh, launching my book um, in September of this past year, um, was up there with my highlight experiences. Number one, having given birth to my beautiful son, having marched into the Olympic Stadium, and then to have launched my book. Now, those are my three. Um, they're, they're all births in a way, you know, certainly the birth of my son, not only birthed me as a mother, but birthed him. But, uh, it, it was just an opening up to the rest of the world to just see how, how huge this event was to see a stadium filled with, you know, a hundred thousand people, you know, and to be part of it. It was, was, it was mind blowing. It, it was amazing. Yeah. So you were, you and uh, Harry went to, uh, you moved to North Vancouver. Your family moved to North Vancouver. When, when I was seven. When you were seven and you went to elementary school there and uh, you faced extreme racism. Uh, you had a neighborhood that was writing letters to not allow you to move into the neighborhood. Well, yeah, that was a petition that was taken to City Hall. Before we even moved in, they had taken a petition to City Hall. And uh, because, you know, most properties, believe it or not, even where you live and I live today, most properties in Greater Vancouver had covenants on them. And the covenants are still there unless you have them removed, saying you will not sell your property to blacks, Asians, or Jews. And um, even the new community center, which is being redeveloped in Harry's name over in North Vancouver, the mayor, Linda Buchanan, was telling me recently that some of the properties that they've bought to expand this Harry Jerome Community Center still have these covenants on it. And it was funny, we laughed about that. They're not enforced anymore. I think they became illegal in 1978. So we lived in a very white world. And so the street we were moving on to in North Vancouver um, was Lower Lonsdale. It was um, Lion Place. It was only a one block long street. It was really a back alley because the people across the street from us, we saw the backs of their houses, not the front. Um, so they did they didn't have covenants and they were really annoyed that this black family was going to move into their neighborhood and so although the petition thankfully failed at city hall in north vancouver the people in the area obviously armed their children for the assault that would take place on their school so the first day of school when we tried to cross eighth street onto ridgeway grounds um the kids were ready for us. Now, how else would they know to hate us and to be ready with piles of rocks? How else would they know other than their parents? Their parents who really didn't want this community to be, you know, violated or, or you know, destroyed in a way. So the people on the street, um, some of the examples of this, number one, the first day of trying to go to school and, and being met with all these stones and we just turned around and ran back home or it was just across the lane, across the road. Um, but, you know, in one, in 1953, we had um, a house fire and at two o'clock in the morning, you know, um, I, I woke up, I went downstairs, I tried to wake my sister. She didn't want to come through all this smoke with me. But anyway, um, we got out into the street and as we were, I, I had gone to the neighbor next door and asked Mrs. Mason, who had never spoken to us, nobody on the street spoke to us except for one family. I had to go and ask her to phone the fire department and she did. And um, as we're listening to the sound of the fire engines coming, we watch the blinds going up on the houses across the street. And nobody came out and offered us a bed. Here's a woman with four children, you know, standing in the middle of the street. The fire engines are coming. And um, they 
raised their blinds, looked out at us, and pulled the blinds down and then did nothing. And so we actually called a cab and went to the Salvation Army Hall on Lonsdale Avenue, uh, where we slept on chairs or tried to sleep on the chairs. We didn't really sleep. But, you know, that's the kind of community that existed here in Canada. This is not a story of Alabama. This is not a story of Chicago. This is North Vancouver. And people say, you know, since the book has come out, well, we didn't know there was all this racism. Well, I'll tell you, those people on that street certainly knew. And that's one of the, I, I've received basically two kinds of responses in letters and emails from people. And one was, we didn't know there was racism in North Vancouver. I lived in North, I didn't see the racism. Well, then you didn't know what racism was. And the, the other comment I've got a lot of, and it's really, um, it's been quite heart-wrenching is these people who've written to say thank you for shining a light on on family violence you know some people i've known for almost a lifetime well my mother used to get drink get drunk they'd say and and throw us against the wall or you know the beatings in our homes and i do think there has been we were a violent society people think it's violent now but it, in the school system I mean, as I, as a teacher for 35 years, occasionally I had to go and witness a great big burly man with a thick, thick razor strap, a three eighths of an inch thick, whack the hands of four year old, not four year old, grade four, nine year old kids. Uh, my younger brother, Bart, and he was mentally handicapped, was strapped because he'd say, just because I can't learn. And our family downloads him to Woodland School why? As he always says, just because I can't learn. But he was strapped at school, and you'd think, here's a great big man, probably 180 pounds, you know, with a razor strap, legitimately, and with the teacher as a witness, strapping a small child, six years old, you know. So would people say they didn't know there was racism or the family violence? I mean, people are acknowledging, I think, the family violence. Racism is a violence. It's a horrific violence. It gives wounds that never go away. And the heart of my story is the racism that we turned in on ourselves came from the outside racism. When my mother was probably 13 years old, her mother went into a new relationship and got rid of her three half-black daughters from her first marriage. And she could never except the fact that she was black and then having married a black man and having black children, it did not make her a happy person because she had lost the love and care and support of her mother. And even just years, just a few years before my mother died, she was, she's on this film that was made by the National Film Board on Harry. It's called Mighty Jerome. There you see my mother being interviewed, and she has chosen the name that they've printed on the screen for her. And her name is not Elsie Jerome Howard, taking Howard as her, her real father's last name, her maiden name. But no, she takes the name Elsie Jerome Sumpton. Now here's a man who was so virulently racist, he would not marry, you know, our grandmother, unless she got rid of these half black girls. So my mother, and she was with Harry when that happened, still wanted to be white. She wanted the love of her mother. And that's what racism has done. It's made people, I think, crazy. Hmm. Well, people today still say that there, you know, isn't systemic racism or there isn't race, right? We hear this all the time. We know that's not true. Uh, well, many of us know it's not true. Um, but I mean, how old are you now? I know you're not supposed to ask a I lady her age, 80. but I, turn <laughs> 80. Right. And the only reason I'm asking you that Valerie is because you have lived a very full life and you have seen a lot and you are finally, finally telling your story in a book. The way well, you, you want to tell the story. And I know that wasn't easy for you either because you had a hard time publishing your book. 
Yes, I wrote it 32 years ago. Now there have been a couple of additions to the version, which I peddled in major publishing companies and small publishing companies in Canada. Um, you know, I was able to include that or have confirmed for me my notion that my mother always wanted to be white because that film of Mighty Jerome came out in 2007 and there you see her blatantly showing that that's who she feels she is or wants to be. And I've learned a lot more about my grandfather. The Canadian Armed Forces did a special on him uh, maybe eight years ago, and likewise the Manitoba Sport Hall of Fame. So I was able to flush out that part of the story. So yes, um, the original version I wrote and rewrote and rewrote and tarred it up, um, was 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 you know really pushed for quite a long time. One of the big publishing companies in this uh, country. I was in Toronto being interviewed by a vice president of one of the companies, and she said, "Well, I've never heard of Harry Jerome," and I said, "Well," and Toronto was a city that featured the Harry Jerome Awards big time. I mean, I used to meet the prime minister there every year and the, you know, the lieutenant governor, the governor general. It was a big event and the Toronto Star published a lot of, um, you know, information about the nominees for the different awards and then, you know, who the winners were. So I thought, here's a woman who reads quite thoroughly, I would think, being a VP of a publishing company. And yet she can say she's never heard. And I, I heard of Harry and I sort of thought, well, the newspapers are full of it. So what happens, I think, for a lot of white people who don't know a thing about people of color is it's like me reading the newspaper and coming to the comic section. They're not my tribe. I just, I skip over because I'm not interested. And I think that's what a lot of white people do. They're reading the newspaper. Well, that's about black people or that's about Filipino people or that's about indigenous people. That's not my tribe. And, um, I, I would like to think that you would want to publish stories about people even that you didn't know. I mean, they don't just publish. I, I, I really felt it was a notion of, well, you're not my tribe. So, and, and what really made me laugh, one of the last, one of the more recent publishers I took the manuscript to, this woman actually said to me, well, it's just loaded with room. She read the book, she said. It's just loaded with relationships and romances of yours and Harry's. I said, romances? I've been looking for one all my life. And and you tell me the book's full of them. I, I need to read this manuscript, you know. So it's um it's it was at times very, very discouraging. But I am, as I say, having the book launched was was like a, a birth for me. It was it was it was amazing. Absolutely. I I recall you um you know, so Harry, Harry becomes this big, big star. And he comes back to Canada, to BC, and he can't even rent an apartment. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, one day he, um, in August 25th, actually, 1962, he ran a world record at Empire Stadium. And he and his wife, the previous week, had been trying to rent an apartment because they had come back to Vancouver from University of Oregon. And he was going to stay in Vancouver for a while to get ready for the 62 Commonwealth Games in Australia. And he and Wendy went out, you know, day after day after day. They looked at every single ad. And finally, our friend Sheila Thompson had to go and rent a place. And my dad experienced the same thing, you know. Um, many years later, you know, he and I would go to all of these apartments in the South Bramble area. And so help me, it was always, you know, it's been taken, it's been taken. But Harry, you know, would try to say, but you, you know, your sign's still out. We were here yesterday and the sign's still out today. And you're telling me it's already rented, you know. I think people think that because, you know, if you go to Stanley Park and I mean, for as long as I can remember, there's a statue of, of Harry there. Um, you, you know, if you're in elementary school here or high school, you will go to a track meet that is named after Harry. And like, we know who he is. We know the name Jerome. We know the name. We know. I would think in my, in, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, there in 1962, but there's a celebrated athlete 
who is is crushing you know records and and um, there's such joy and excitement around it. I would think that when he's walking down the streets in North Vancouver and coming back home, that people are, you know, surrounding him for autographs and hugs and, you know, and, and renting a place is no problem. And it's, it's really, this is important to know. Well, the thing is, you know, people look south of the border and they see that the racism exists. For example, Duke Ellington always had his own train because he knew his band could never rent a hotel or stay at a hotel when they traveled all over the place. So Duke Ellington, you know, for all his musicians, they, they had a train and that's how they traveled. And people can have fame as black people. When I think of Harry Belafonte uh, in the early days of his career, this absolutely beautiful and gifted man, you know, he would not be allowed to stay in any of the hotels in Las Vegas where he was a headliner and people bought tickets and couldn't even get tickets half the time to see him. That's that's the fact for people even known the world over, you know. Um, yeah, I, I it's this is this is why your story is so important. I can't believe it took, you know, so long to publish your your words and your observations and your experience because this is how we learn right because we don't know the real story of what it was like with you and harry growing up just across the bridge here from where you know you and i live it's right there i can see it from <laughs> you know so it it and we know it still exists today we know we still have a lot of work to do um, I have, I, before we get into that though, I just want to mention that we do like to thank our guests for being here. And so we do that by giving a gift to the Canadian uh, charity of, of choice and you chose Oxfam Canada. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And we will be giving them a gift um, as a thank you for you being here. So thank you for choosing them. Well, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Yes. Well, I mean, we're grateful to hear your your um your words and your your important memoir and reminding us of how it was how we can do better and and I'm curious about the legacy that you want for your family you must think of that often about you know yes there's a statue yes there's things named after your brother and after your family when when you what do you want people to know about your family? Well, one of the things that I think people, um, many people, well, and, and I do want to clarify the fact that, you know, when you get out of this province, really nobody has heard of Harry. And, um, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm trying to get speaking gigs in, in Ontario right now because a couple of people have invited me to speak in Toronto. But, you know, the, and those will be small gatherings. Harry is not known on the rest of of Canada now, especially since the Harry Jerome Awards have disappeared in Toronto. So it's, um, sometimes I think we're a bit naive here. We think that people have heard of people that we've heard. Of. And also we think that every, but the Vancouverites go to Stanley Park. You know who goes to Stanley Park? Tourists and joggers, people who run the seawall and tourists. Most um, Vancouver children have never been to Stanley Park believe it or not. But speaking of legacy, one of the things I did want to make clear in, in the book, because Harry's running career, you know, ends halfway or maybe two thirds of the way through the book. Harry spent his life trying to give children the opportunities that he had had. He was for ever grateful. And he was always, he, he traveled from one end of this province to the, to the other um, in his last years, trying to get opportunities for children. And um, I, I have this wonderful dear friend, um, Lorna Williams, who's an indigenous woman who works internationally on preserving uh, indigenous languages. And she was, and uh, we've become very good friends, but she was she wanted me to know that long, long ago in the 60s, um, her brother came down from the reserve in uh, Lillooet, or actually um, Mount Curry, uh, to compete at a track meet. And he sat out in the middle of the infield, putting on these old 
scrappy looking spikes uh, getting ready for a race and along comes Harry jogging to the warm up and Harry sat down and talked to this young man for close to an hour giving him tips on this that and the other and telling him how to run his race and letting him know that he was really pleased that this kid had come by himself from so far away to run in a track meet that's who Harry was yes the world records get broken you know, I mean, saying Bolt has eradicated, you know, records for 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 the future for quite a while. Whereas Harry's real goal was to get kids. And so his big project at the end of his life was this Premier Sports Award. And there's a photograph in the book. Harry had died just at the time we were launching the program. But the one millionth crest was being awarded. And there's Silken Lom and a well-known um, Canadian Olympian, um, honoring uh, Harry's legacy by presenting the one millionth crest. And I'm, I'm so proud of that because I do want people to know that it meant more to Harry to get some child involved um, or, and girls didn't play soccer, you know, in those long ago days to expand the opportunities because he benefited from his athletic career and he felt it opened his world and he wanted so much to do this he when you read the book you find out there are umpteen projects throughout the book that he works and works and works away at and the last one is the premier sport award and that's the legacy that he would like and that's why you know we unveiled that statue my the children in my class actually unveiled the statue that's who harry would have wanted unveiling the statue not some you know 65 year old politician yeah you no know. you both became educators yes yes well for, for women, actually, in, in my day, when I was graduating from high school, you either became a, you know, a Safeway clerk, a secretary, a nurse, or a teacher. And uh, since I wanted to go to university, the teaching was certainly more important. Our track co coach, John Minichello, was a good example. Uh, the families that uh, took me in as a foster child um, were educators educators as well. And of course, my dad couldn't think of anything better for me than to become a teacher. So part of what I think also drove me as a teacher and why I'm still in touch with hundreds of my former students is because I want, I felt everybody had the potential. And somebody whom we haven't mentioned in this conversation, other than by getting the strap, was my younger brother, Barton, who I think is one of the heroes of the book. I think he is his his life was just as successful for him as was Harry. He really did miracles. And he was an amazing soul. And, um, you know, I, I think that um, everybody has value, you know, and that's what I loved about teaching. It wasn't whether or not you were getting good marks that would show me as a good teacher because you've happened to be gifted and got good marks. But, but it's a place for all of us. Yeah, there is a place for all of us. You're right. When, you know, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I was just thinking about your brother and how your voice changes when you do talk about your siblings. I can see it in your in your face, the love that you have. Um, Harry died when he was 42. I didn't I didn't know he was so young. I don't know why I didn't know his age, I guess, because when you're little, everybody seems old. <laughs> yes, that's true. It's true. And so, but now, of course, looking at it as an adult, I had no idea he was so young. Do you, do you think about your family every day? Do you think about? A lot, a lot. One of the things that has happened since my book has been published, you know, I, I, I have never been a good sleeper. I've always been churning this book over. I've been worried about the reaction of my sisters and, you know, um, it has caused me a lot of stress. I'd go to bed every night thinking about, since the book has been published, I sleep all night. It's amazing. And for the first time since Harry died, I actually had a dream about him about two weeks ago. You know, it's always been such a painful and harried and harried, nothing to do with my brother's name, 
or my father's name. Um, I feel that I have been freed. I have, I have given, I have let go of a lot of this. And um, my sisters have not come down on my head, you know, both of them thinking that, of course, this is all personal, private material, and it should not be out there in the public, and, and this is not good. Um, I, I feel a, a lot more at peace. Number one, they hardly reacted at all. And, um, and I feel I've unburdened myself and it, and it's out there, but, uh, it's been, you know, it's been turning over and over and over in my mind continually since actually since Harry died, it was a huge loss for me. He, um, he had such an effect on my life. He pulled me out the track. He made me do things that, you know, um, and, and so I've sort of done that to all of my students too, you know, pull them into the best they can be and find the opportunities that are good for you, you know, appreciate yourself, you know. It's really hard as a person of color to learn to appreciate themselves. Our society excluded us from textbooks in schools. Um, we were hardly ever shown to be anything other than, you know, perhaps criminal. And, uh, by producing the book, I feel I have um, freed myself from a lot of those fears. I think fear has been the number one operative in much of my life, and uh, I'm not afraid anymore. I've taken this big step and exposed the family, as my sisters like to say. But... Well, we appreciate it because this book yeah. is, you know, it's important, Valerie, and it's, you know, it says right on the right on the cover of your book, you know, a must read for every Canadian. The book is called Races, The Trials and Triumphs of Canada's Fastest Family, written by Valerie Jerome. Uh, you can find out more information. There it is right there about the book online at gooselane.com slash races. Valerie, thank you so, so much for this conversation today. I could talk to you for weeks, I think. Um, I well, really, really could. Um, yeah. But buy the book. And thank you so much, Valerie, for your time. Well, thank you very much, Tamara. I feel very honored. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart. Be sure to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for another conversation. You can also check out our website, tellus.com slash podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Tell Us Talks.